Now it is my great dismay to have to tell you that Sarah Harper unfortunately couldn't make it. She had some family issues in, uh, that kept her back in Oxford. So we're moving right to one of the major technological breakthroughs that will affect health in the very near future. And this is genome analysis, DNA sequencing. And even though much of this success has unfortunately taken place in the United States, and particularly Switzerland has completely lost out on the genomics era. We're there on the next uh, wave, the proteomics era, but the genomics era we left out. But the stakes have been kept very high uh, for, for Europe in Oxford. And Hagen Bailey, our next speaker, is a professor of biochemistry at Oxford, and he really has shown us how to transform basic research into applicable products. And he, will, he has initiated and founded the company that is now called Oxford Nanopore, who has really the third generation DNA sequencing technology that will bring almost surely DNA sequencing to your iPhone. And I won't say any more about that, but it's a great pleasure to have you here, Hagen, and tell us about uh, DNA sequencing and how that will affect health. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, Anne, thanks so much, and thanks to Health Ties and Zurich and the rest of you for being here. So I'm, my day job is a professor at Oxford, and I'm also, as Ant said, a, um, the founder of Oxford Nanobore Technologies. He gave me the title, I think, towards the $100 genome. I've, been, I've backed off a little to the um, $1,000 genome. But I, I think one take-home message from what I'll say is that the cost is so low now that it really hardly matters. What we're heading towards is um, um, extremely rapid genome sequencing. So genome sequencing today is cheap, rapid, and I believe very soon it's going to be basically push button, that it can be do it done by unskilled people. Um, the sequencing technology, I think, is already making huge contributions to society, and it's going to make um, even greater contributions. Um, but it also poses some ethical problems, and when I looked at the list of speakers today, I thought I would, um, would highlight some of those, as well as the benefits. So just very briefly to review the issues in genome sequencing, we can ask, what is our genome? Well, we have a, a polymer in each one of our cells called DNA, and there are four bases, so-called bases on that polymer, G, A, T, and C, and they're organized in a specific order, that um, encodes um, uh, really what we are. Uh, the problem is that there are six billion of these bases, so it's quite um, a tricky problem um, to decode them. And interestingly, each of your genomes is two meters in length, so each of your cells, which is one one hundredth, uh, one one hundred thousandths of a meter across, has all this DNA packed inside it. So this DNA programs our cells, and um, by implication uh, programs us. That's not to say the environment is not um, important. So um, to an extent, which is debatable then, it determines what we are. Um, some of these, uh, this is called our phenotype, some of these things are pretty mundane, our height, our susceptibility to disease. Um, some of them are more controversial, our tendency to be aggressive, for example example, or our, maybe our intellectual abilities. Um, it was said, I think by answer, that um, a lot of this technology really comes from the states. I, I would argue against that. I think the er early technology um, has really um, come from the UK. And the original Human Genome Project, the Human Genome Sequence, was finished in 2003 at a um, huge cost, about um, $3 billion after 10 years of effort. And the technology that was used for that was invented by a guy called Fred Sanger in Cambridge. Uh, by 2007, just four years later, the cost of sequencing 
a human genome by his technology had dropped to $70 million, um, which is still quite a high cost for a medical test, but a, a, an astounding um, <laughs> decrease in price. But um, at the end of 2007 and 2008, something really amazing happened. There was the development of um, second generation um, sequencing. There are various techniques for doing that. But 90% of DNA now is sequenced by so-called Illumina technology that was developed again in Cambridge um, by um, Shankar, by the Subramanian, who's shown on my slide, and a guy called uh, David Kleneman. And um, within five years, from 2003, the cost of sequencing had been reduced by 100,000 to a million fold. And uh, the, sequ the secret to that was highly parallel sequencing, sequencing on the today's machine, three billion pieces of DNA simultaneously. So the cost of sequencing now is certainly well less than um, $10,000. It just depends how you cost it. Um, but let me say, at this point, it's quite slow. It's not, it doesn't take the 10 years that it costs for the original human genome, but it takes a couple of weeks to, to get a genome sequence. And um, here are the data supporting that. Um, I would say for the scientists among you, you can note that the left-hand scale is a logarithmic scale. So it shows um, the absolutely incredible um, decrease in the cost of sequencing um, the human genome. And now it really is the cost of um, a medical test. Uh, I, I don't know the exact up-to-date statistics, but I would say everyone in, in the United States spends uh, between $5,000 and $10,000 a year on health care. So this is getting into the realm of one year's worth of health care. It's soon going to be about one month's worth of, of health care. So this has affected um, various areas. Medicine, which I'll focus on today, but other things of human interest are ancestry and forensics and so on. Um, so for example, in medicine, we can predict um, treatable and also untreatable conditions in, in newborns by doing genome sequencing. Um, I'm just giving a few examples of many. Uh, we can monitor and treat cancer much better than we could before. We can actually um, much more precisely select drugs. And we can um, give much more exact prognoses. Sometimes these are positive. Sometimes these are devastatingly um, negative. One um, incredible discovery that goes back to 1997, but it, it couldn't really be used then, is that we can also sequence fragments of DNA and RNA that are circulating in our bloodstream. They're not actually in cells. So these are pieces of DNA that have been shed by an unborn baby, by a tumor, and um, even by the food um, that you've eaten. And um, here's Dennis Lowe. He was actually um, came from Oxford, so this was done the year after he, he moved to, to Hong Kong. At that time, in 1997, genome sequencing was very expensive, but now it's possible to take a, a blood sample from a woman and construct the entire genome of the fetus um, that is as yet unborn. It's possible to reconstruct the genome of tumor cells that are in a remote site in your body and actually see that DNA disappear when the tumor is treated. So I'll just give you um, a couple of the examples of kind of the remarkable things that have come from genomics. Here's an example. Um, I hope there aren't too many smokers here. But this is um, an example where the genome of a person that died um, from lung cancer, so the, the the sequence, so they sequence both the tumor cells and the unaffected cells. And um, I'm not sure if I can get this pointer to work here. Around here, the, this big circle represents the entire genome sequence. And um, from the layperson's point of view, um, I can just tell you it's severely messed up. So each one of those lines represents dislocations in the genome, pieces that have moved from one part of the genome to the other, to between chromosomes or within chromosomes. But amazingly, each one of those red dots represents a mutation in, in the genome. 
and there are 50,000 of those red dots. And um, it's reckoned that this poor person got a, a mutation in the genome for every three cigarettes that, they, that the person smoked. Um, I would say in terms of dilemmas and ethics, we don't know which of those mutations are responsible for um, the lung cancer this, uh, this person got. Um, Alzheimer's disease, um, if, if you, um, you can just do a test for a gene called the E4 variant of APOE, but of course it would come out in genome sequencing. 90% of people who have this E4 variant um, will have Alzheimer's by the time they're 80. That's probably something people don't want to know. Normal would be 10 or 15 percent. Um, just a few weeks ago was published a study by a mutation in another gene that overrides that um, E4 mutation. That required the sequences of 2,000, almost 2,000 human genomes to, to get that information. So the take home from this is Alzheimer's disease is very complex, but we're getting into a position where we can, um, to some extent, predict who will get Alzheimer's and when they will get Alzheimer's. And of course, at this point, Alzheimer's is incurable. So along these lines, very recently, Paul Nurse, who is a British Nobel Prize winner, president of the Royal Society, um, has argued that we should all share our medical records. Um, and one question you might ask is whether you would like the NHS or an insurance company to have your genome sequence. Would it be identified specifically with you, or would it be coded in some way? Um, but there are some very prominent people arguing for the fact that we should just share this data um, for the greater good. Um, just very quickly, in another two areas, in ancestry, um, genomics now is incredibly powerful. Would, do you really want to know who your cousins are, maybe who your father is about, uh, depending on the population, 10 to 30 percent of uh, fathers turn out to be surprises, let's put it that way. And, um, <laughs> So and, uh, so, and this is very powerful information in that you can actually um, find out about your relatives. And as you know, people have been convicted when uh, databases moving on to forensics have relatives' DNA, not just your DNA. And there's a big question now of who should be on the national database in the UK. All those people who were actually not convicted that were meant to be removed never were removed. So having said that, um, let's talk about third generation um, DNA sequencing. This is going to be extremely fast, very cheap, $100 maybe, 100 pounds, and basically push button. So someone could buy a device, um, take some DNA um, that um, someone put, put on a glass or a Coke can by drinking something and sequence it. And, um, this is based on a technology that was partly developed in my lab. It's a very simple idea that you pull a piece of DNA through a pore, and as that DNA goes through the pore, um, there's an electrical current that flows to that pore at the same time. You can read off the bases by the change um, in the, the electrical current. So um, to cut a long story, sh story short, this is very rapid indeed. So if you could um, sequence from a million of these pores simultaneously, which we believe is technically possible, you could get a, a genome sequence in 10 minutes at um, extremely low, low cost. And um, some of you might remember the movie Gattaca that uh, came out in 1997 um, that was really based on this idea that you could sequence a person's DNA essentially w within a few minutes. And um, at the time that came out, um, I, I would say that most scientists, my lab, my PhD students and postdocs and things, um, just thought it was laughable. We just went and watched this thing for fun to see how Hollywood could make fools of themselves. Well, well they didn't, I don't think. Um, so anyway, in 2005, we formed a company um, called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. You'll see from the quote on this slide, uh, Bailey speaks in the iconic baritone of a late-night DJ. 
if he has an entrepreneurial streak, it's not obvious, um, but um, um, you can imagine the role I, I played in the company, but um, uh, Gordon Sangera, who came from Abbott Labs, and Spike Wilcox from a um, company called IP, IP Group, uh, um, really um, played very important roles in setting up this company. It now has 120 people working for it in Oxford, again, a UK um, company, and uh, um, has obtained substantial funding for its work. So um, in February of this year, the company announced that they could, um, they, uh, the technology had actually worked in, in Oxford, and um, it does promise, as I said earlier, to sequence a human genome in, uh, in 10 or 15 minutes. So this third generation technology, whether it's Oxford Nanopores or some other companies that work, works out, um, will be yet more powerful than the second generation technology. It will produce real-time sequence, the sequence will just come out before your very eyes, you won't have to wait 11 days. Um, won't require any sample preparation, for those of you who know about these things, no chips, polymerase, chain reaction or anything like that. It will be essentially push-button operation. And um, it will do things like re reveal modified bases in DNA, which I can't talk about now, but and how genes are linked to each other. So it will be a much more powerful uh, genome uh, sequencing technology. So obviously this, um, in terms of medicine, is, is, will be revolutionary. This will be something that you can um, do in a doctor's office, particularly, I think, in the UK. GPs tend just to have stethoscopes, but there are other countries where they have other instruments. And so I, I could, I could um, imagine this in a, in a doctor's office and someone doing a genome sequence really um, on the spot. But again, it raises certain ethical problems. Your colleague at work could get your genome sequence pretty, pretty readily. But um, let me end by saying, I think, um, and it's just a a personal feeling, I think this is 95% positive. We have to be careful about the um, ethical issues. And uh, I like this quote from Bill Clinton when the, the rough genome sequence came out in 2000. Uh, he couldn't possibly have envisaged that this year we'll be sequencing tens of thousands of human genomes. But even at that time, he was able to say that without doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Thank you.